Okay. Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody tonight <coughs> to our, I don't know what number episode it is, but. Uh, <coughs> 3,643. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Give them the format, Charlie. You, you, you're the intro. All right. All right. The, the format consists of the following. Our speaker will speak up to about an hour or so. Then we'll take questions and answers. And after we take our questions and answers, we'll each have a chance to rebut the speaker, whether on or off topic. Generally, we go till about nine o'clock. And then afterwards, we have to rec after the official meeting ends, we'll keep Zoom call open. <coughs> Sorry about this. Let's now start with our announcements. So, Charlie, go ahead and take it away. Okay, welcome to meeting 3,643 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Uh, first of all, we have a Google email group, which you can join. There's instructions at the top of our website. Uh, there's also a meetup group. You will get one or two uh, emails a week, that's all, uh, informing you uh, the upcoming topic for the week. I've also, uh, if you scroll down a little, back up, Tim, I've got a new, scroll to the top, Tim. Uh, I've also done a rescheduling. If Scroll up, please. If it says current schedule of the speakers, uh, I reformatted the schedule. There, it's very easy to read. So if you want to take advantage of that, please do so. Okay, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs very briefly. Uh, next Saturday, January 27th, a seasoned speaker and participant at the college, Jan Lee, will give us again another well-informed and research topic on racism. She says the current concepts of racism are out of date. On December the 4th, we will be undertaking to discuss again um, ecological issues. The Illinois Environmental Council will be returning. These are the big shot agency uh, the, uh, of the e eco people in Illinois. On December the 11th, we will have a new speaker who will try to convince us how, how to, he's got a way that you can talk with difficult people. Now, this is what everybody this should be mandatory attendance for some of you guys. On December the 18th, Charles Earp would be returning. This, they just started meeting and said he's got a church of the revolution. And there's Charlie there. Uh, so December the 18th, theological issues. And with January the 8th, an organization I've been affiliated with uh, for sustainable green communities, uh, America Walks for pedestrian advocacy, where you don't need pipelines to take a walk yeah, around, so. down, around the neighborhood. On January the 15th, we just booked the Libertarian Party of Chicago and Illinois are going to try to convince us of the evils of government. On January the 22nd, uh, we're going to have a new new organization uh, who is seeking to establish a just society. Should be a very interesting <coughs> program. The next open date, if you would like to speak at the college, is January the 29th, and we have four dates open in February. Thank you, Tim. Take it away. Me. You're muted, Tim. All right. My apologies. I was coughing too much and I muted my microphone. Um, if one of our speakers wants to start and take it away and do the formal introduction, I will do so now. So go ahead. Yep. Okay. We're ready to roll. Uh, my name is Angela Bull. I'm the communications director for the Coalition for the National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, we're going to have uh, a couple of speakers tonight, and I think we're going to jump right in. Uh, we're going to do a PowerPoint given by one of our coordinators to Rosenblatt, 
Uh, we'll then hear from uh, one of our local um, labor officials. Uh, his name is Rick Lashina. He's the legislative representative of BLT, mm -hmm. IBT from Aurora Cicero, Illinois. And then uh, we'll hear from Stan Forzik, who is an infrastructure consultant, mm -hmm. and a former executive from Amtrak. So I think we're just going to begin. <clears throat> okay, great. Uh, we want to thank everybody for giving us the opportunity. Uh, we're not going to take up a full hour, uh, but we'll take up just a short amount of your time and then throw it open for questions. Uh, what we're here to talk about is a bill that's in the Congress, uh, which will create a uh, $5 trillion national infrastructure bank, uh, but it's not really a bank. It's really a massive uh, intervention to shift the economy back to infrastructure and uh, manufacturing. The bill is, uh, was introduced by uh, Congressman Danny Davis from Chicago, and it also has Chewy Garcia and uh, Bobby Rush as co-sponsors and Mondaire Jones uh, from New York. And we're in an active uh, effort right now to get more co-sponsors now that the uh, two bills that were in front of the House have now passed and uh, one is uh, on its way to the Senate. Uh, this bank is modeled on previous, four previous such banks, not exact uh, detail of each one, uh, but the concept going back to the national banking of uh, George Washington and that Broadway star Alexander Hamilton, uh, and then all the way up through the last iteration, which was the Reconstruction Finance Corporation of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, which uh, really uh, helped through the Public Works Administration and WPA, which had financed both of them uh, to build an immense amount of the infrastructure uh, that you know carried the country through the middle of the uh, 1970s and still, unfortunately, a lot of it is still around only because it should have been replaced. Okay, uh, the cur our go ahead next. Uh, the bank that we are proposing is a $5 trillion bank. It would be created by repurposing existing treasury debt. It would involve no new federal spending. I'm gonna say that again, no new federal appropriations. It would be capitalized by holders, uh, private holders of US treasuries of which there are 20 trillion floating around the country and the world. And that would include foreign countries, Japan and China, which each hold a trillion, Germany, South Korea, Britain, et cetera. And it would also encompass uh, other private holders across the US, pension funds, cities, states, corporations, banks, uh, all hold treasuries uh, for the purpose of long-term savings. The bank would offer them the right to exchange their treasuries for equivalent amount of preferred stock in the bank uh, and give them a 2% uh, additional interest to entice them to put the money in, the investment would be, the, the legal strictures would be identical with what they have with their treasuries. Full faith and credit of the government, plus the additional 2%, the 2% would come from the earnings stream of the bank. The bank would be created as a regular commercial bank with a federal mandate uh, to build infrastructure only. That was a nice slide, it's about to go to. <laughs> Uh, if, if Actually, the, it's, the, it's the wrong slide. I think we're looking close at enough. I, it's, it's all right. Uh, if you've got a better version, that's fine. Otherwise, I'll, I'll jump back in again. Uh, the reason why we came up with a $5 trillion bank is we took the money that the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers says is not funded uh, through either the federal budget or state and local governments. The gap uh, which you uh, actually see uh, in the top right-hand corner of $2.6 trillion. Uh, and then there's no money for a lot of other basic things, which we'll go into. Uh, what, the, what this chart goes through very, just kind of uh, in a very cursory way, uh, and it's itself uh, not the latest iteration, but it compares the spending in the new uh, uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, we'll call it IIJA, the infrastructure bill with what really needs to be done and what our uh, National Infrastructure Bank will do. And if you look at the uh, categories on the left-hand side, those are the categories the civil engineers say have to be funded. 
Um, and the uh, amount on the right-hand side is what the National Infrastructure Bank would actually cover. We have a much more updated study, which we'll get to you, but uh, the amount of uh, money in the new bill uh, comes up about a trillion dollars short to cover roads and bridges. Near, go on, go, go past it. A, a trillion dollars short on water, no money for high-speed rail, no money for uh, affordable housing, uh, no money for uh, water <laughs> projects for the West, uh, which is in severe drought, et cetera. So the National Infrastructure Bank would cover all of that. This is a schematic of how the uh, bank would be created and how it would lend out money. I am not going to go through that. We're going to send this slideshow, I guess you already have it, uh, for all of your uh, active members and supporters to be able to walk through. I'm just giving you the kind of thumbnail uh, sketch of it. Uh, you can go on. The, the bank would, uh, in the process of uh, coming up to $5 trillion spending, uh, would actually be able to create, yeah, uh, that, let's forget the rest Yeah, this is the wrong PowerPoint. Yeah, the bank would actually be able to create, uh, we believe upwards of 20 to 25 million new jobs, uh, pay Davis-Bacon wages, uh, project labor agreements, it's all written into the legislation, uh, serious uh, mandatory investment in uh, poor and rural uh, communities, uh, would uh, be mandating uh, hiring of uh, minorities, disadvantaged businesses, uh, et cetera, and would really act to, uh, frankly, supercharge the economy there is a specific uh, driver capability uh, in the bank uh, around, oh, that's, yeah, that's the, that's the- What page? So, uh, I'll just go to about page four. Let's see where that takes us. Right there. Well, that's pretty good. I mean, this is what I just said, 25 million new jobs by American GDP <laughs> would increase up to uh, 5% per year, uh, which right now we're at about, I, I, nobody knows, 1.7, 1.5. Uh, per year, and you can go on to the next one if you've got it. Oh, that's nice. This is how the bank would give out loans. These are the categories I just went through. Uh, one, you know, one trillion for water systems, one trillion for uh, road repair. This is over and above the bill that just got passed. Uh, Three hundred billion to upgrade the power grid. A hundred, really, probably will be more like one hundred and fifty billion for broadband everywhere. Housing is a gigantic issue. I know it's a gigantic issue in Chicago. Uh, this is the only institution configured uh, to build, uh, directly build 7 million new affordable housing units uh, and has the money to do it, 400 billion for water projects, et cetera. And then again, the 1.1 trillion for high-speed rail. Uh, go ahead. This just just what I went through briefly, the difference between what's in the bill that just passed versus, you know, what we're calling for. You could just go on. We could always take it up in the Q&A. And this will be the, uh, really the last one I'll go through. Uh, the, the centerpiece of the infrastructure bank will be rail. Uh, and for a variety of reasons, uh, not the least of which is, you know, we'll deal with the CO2 problem. We'll deal with traffic congestion, which is an immense problem all across the country, and a radical uh, increase in the efficiency of the economy. We want to build uh, both passenger rail systems across the country. The new bill that just passed Congress, which we like, uh, really has a big emphasis on Amtrak and the Northeast Corridor, which is good. It's long overdue. Uh, it just doesn't cover the whole country. But our big focus, in addition, is high-speed rail. This just gives you a sense of the rail corridors uh, that we want to build. This is a map that was developed by uh, Alexander Metcalf, who you, some of you may be familiar with, uh, is a top uh, rail uh, and infrastructure expert in the country. The idea of the high-speed rail system is that it would uh, go along economic corridors and not just build rail, but build everything on each side of the rail. And you can see Chicago, of course, is the hub for the Midwest, uh, connecting uh, east, west, north, south, uh, and on and on. So I'm not gonna go through any more. That kind of gives you a thumbnail sketch of what we're up to. 
Uh, and then I'll let uh, Angela introduce Rick and then, uh, then we'll go to Stan. Well, I think we'll just go directly to Rick. Rick, if you'd like to make some comments. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you all for being here and giving us the opportunity to talk. Um, you know, Rick Lashina, I'm with the I'm an actual locomotive engineer and with the uh, legislative representative for the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen out of uh, Aurora, Cicero, Illinois. Um, again, being that I am a locomotive engineer, of course, we're interested in high speed rail. Uh, looking at uh, with the modernization and uh, expansion of passenger rail and improve the freight rail efficiency and safety in the new legislation. Uh, again, we're very happy and glad with the passage of the, of the infrastructure bill that's passed. Um, but again, they're, they're, it's lacking on some of the investments. Um, we, um, as a background for who, those of you who might not be aware, Chicago, of course, has been a rail hub for over 150 years and has remained the uh, nation's busiest rail hub. Each day, nearly 500 freight trains and 760 passenger trains pass through region in Actually, 25% of all U.S. freight rail originate or stops here in Chicago. Um, again, the bipartisan infrastructure law includes $66 billion, as it's currently my understanding, above baseline. And of that, $12 billion for partnership grants for infrastructure, inner city rail, pardon me, and uh, including high speed rail, which just is not enough. Um, again, interested in high speed rail. China high speed rail uh, got 23,500 miles of you know criss high speed rail crisscrossing the country yeah. linking all of its major mega cities clusters and all have been completed since 2008 uh, the US as of May 6 2021 had 33.9 miles uh, which support train speeds in excess of 150 miles per hour you know the US is lacking not because we can't do it, but uh, the money hasn't been there. Uh, of course, and, and high-speed rail has been around since 1964 when Japan created the first high-speed rail line at speed of 130 miles per hour. Again, just a background. Um, FRA has a new Midwest regional plan that envisions a network that cr consists of high four pillar corridors, all radiating from Chicago with uh, endpoints of uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, St. Louis, Indianapolis, Detroit, to uh, you know existing or future, you know, points destinations. Um, again, the, the money in this new bill, we're happy with what money is there, but the, feel that National Infrastructure Bank offers a real opportunity to do something. Um, being from the Chicagoland area, where we all you know with the water infrastructure, a lead service line replacement. $15 billion is in the new infrastructure bill. And, I, you know, I'm just, just Googling Chicago out of the trains article from 2020, they, they estimated $10 billion cost for Chicago just to replace lead service lines. Again, it's not the current bill. Yes, we're happy with the money. We all are, you know, that they're actually doing something, but the, the National Infrastructure Bank actually offers an opportunity to, to do, do these projects. Um, broad, they offer broadband, you know, broadband deserts. I live in the third Illinois third district and just in, in the Illinois Southwest Chicago, which is not rural, there are broadband deserts located here. You know, my, my Congresswoman Newman has pointed that out. Um, many, myself included, many members, you know, we it's just kicking the can down the road still. It, it's National Infra Infrastructure Bank Act of 2021 Field creates a real opportunity, you know, to actually do the projects that are necessary. Um, you know, as far as who's been involved, like the Chicago City Council has passed a resolution in support. Illinois State, Illinois House have entered, both entered resolutions in the state um, passed. And again, it's Chicago with Danny Davis, he uh, as, as sponsor of this bill, it's Chicago based. Um, and that's it's a real opportunity to do some some big projects that should be done and make us U.S. a leader again, in my humble opinion. Thank you. Good, thanks, Rick. So I think we'll go on to Stan. You can reintroduce yourself, Stan, and uh, you know, give your spiel. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, good evening, and thanks so much for allowing us uh, to speak with you uh, this evening. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, as I mentioned in the very beginning, I am a retired executive from Amtrak. I spent over 30 years there. Uh, most of the people that are on the phone are from Illinois. I can tell you that I, I was the first director of finance for the Northeast Corridor Operating Group, but I spent a lot of time in Chicago and worked on a lot of infrastructure projects, including some of those uh, around Union Station and the yard that's out there. Uh, I also retire from an energy consulting firm. Uh, I've worked a little bit on my own. I've worked for Goldman Sachs and several engineering companies here on the East Coast. Uh, what we're trying to explain, and I hope we're, we're making it uh, at least uh, clear to everyone, is that there is a bill, and we're very happy that a bill has been put out, but it's extremely small in relationship to what's needed. What's needed is in excess of $5 trillion. <laughs> the new bill gives $550 billion. As Rick mentioned just a few moments ago, uh, there is in, in the, in the uh, bill that's approved $55 billion for the change out of all the water systems in the United States to eliminate the lead that's in the pipes. Chicago alone, one city, is going to cost about $15 billion. So what's left for all the rest of the cities that are in the United States? Not much. Not much at all. The same is true. There's not any money other than for the Northeast Corridor, which I will tell you because I did the budgeting for Amtrak, and I know how hard it is for Amtrak to come up with strategic plans and budgeting because the FRA actually gets in the way and wants to do things their way instead of what might be the correct way for passengers. Uh, there's a lot of regulation that's out there. Most of the time Amtrak receives about 65% of the money that's really allocated. So there's not gonna be enough money to do everything for high-speed rail across the country. Let me also say something that came up before we started the meeting, and that is the environmental problems that we have in this country. We've mentioned that China and Japan have high-speed rail. What we didn't mention is they power that rail utilizing fossil fuels. The United States does not want to use fossil fuels, so the best way to do it is probably to electrify everything that's out there because you're going to use a lot less fossil fuels in electricity than you would that, uh, uh, by, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I shouldn't say it that way. You're going to use far less electricity, number one, because of the efficiency that's there and you won't be using uh, a large amount because the energy portfolio in the United States is changing, and that portfolio is going to go to environmentally clean energy. The issue revolving around everything I'm trying to speak about is the fact that the bill is way too small, will not get anything done. Stewart mentioned in the very beginning that there were four banks prior to this. And by the way, the other countries that I mentioned and have been mentioned here, China, Japan, Canada, countries in Europe, South America, and countries in, in Africa, all use the same model we're talking about right now for a national infrastructure bank. So they're using the model, and we stopped using it in 1957. That's when Roosevelt's bank came to term. And that's not a coincidence, because we really haven't done large infrastructure projects since that time. 90% of the nation's infrastructure was built by those four banks, and they haven't done anything since then. So that's why our infrastructure is going downhill. We, don't, we just don't need water. We just don't need uh, transportation. Think about Chicago and the highways that lead into the city of Chicago. They're pretty nice until you get about two miles away from the city limits. But when you get into the city limits, 
you can see that the curbs have rebar popping out, that there are potholes, that there's not enough lanes, people are, have gridlock. Chicago alone, people spend an extra 150 hours a year sitting in cars instead of using mass transit. And that's what we're saying. We, uh, as Rick mentioned, broadband is very critical. You have dead zones in Illinois. You have dead zones in Michigan. You have a lot of dead zones as you get further and further to the south, uh, to, to the western part of the United States. And here's another interesting point. We're talking about water and water distribution. Do you realize that there are portions or regions in New Mexico, Alaska, and other states that don't have running water? But yet, the approved bill wants to change out all of the water systems for $55 billion. This is America. We should be thinking about doing everything, not something piecemeal. Aren't we tired of kicking the can down the road and doing a little bit here and a little bit there? Because it's not really working. And unless we move forward with the National Infrastructure Bank, and we may need to have amendments to that bank because the bill or the need is such that it, it probably is somewhere between seven trillion and 10 trillion. One last point, as we sit here and we try to move forward, and I can tell you that the bill that's out there and approved, you're not gonna see a lot of things done real quick. But the infrastructure continues to decay. As each year goes by, the cost of infrastructure uh, improvements is going to go up by $200 billion to $700 billion. So the issue is, if you spend $550 billion and you get a few things done, that means that the rest of the infrastructure, the cost, which is now 10 times more than what that bill is, is going to increase 200 billion to 700 billion dollars a year. Do we really want that? Because eventually you're never going to get caught up and you're never going to be able to pay for it. That's all I want to say. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, I'll just say before we open it up for questions, uh, as you heard, our coalition uh, supports what is going on in Washington in terms of the bill. However, what distinguishes our group from the legislation in Congress is two things. One is that we are really facing the real reality of where the country is. And we equate this with what uh, was uh, happening in the country in 1933 when Franklin Roosevelt took office. It is no different. Uh, we have massive uh, uh, inequality. We have, uh, as you know, massive problems in infrastructure, much higher unemployment than people want to admit, and all kinds of other uh, social problems. So the thing that is different is one, that we're facing the reality of what the country needs. As we laid out, it's $5 trillion and more. And the other side of it is, is that we have a way to pay. Uh, this is, is not about raising taxes. Even if you know the Biden administration does raise corporate taxes, this is only gonna be somewhere between 200 billion to maybe 400 billion. The rest is gonna be added to the deficit. Our bill will not add to the deficit and it will increase production and growth, which is critical right now to get the country moving in terms of uh, people having faith in the government, being optimistic about the future, and actually identifying that this country has been on the wrong track for the last 50 years. Unless we wanna radically change directions, we need this kind of institution to do it. So, uh, and I'll just wrap up by saying that because of this reality and our ability to pay, this is why our coalition is growing very, very rapidly. 
As you heard, we have legislation that has passed or been introduced in Illinois. We have over 20 state legislatures that have either introduced or passed resolutions. We've got national organizations, we've got labor unions, grassroots organizations, city councils, county councils, and the list goes on. So basically what we're identifying now is that we've got a movement growing in the country. We wanna put pressure on the US Congress and say, okay, you did your bit. You know, we know where you stand. We know what you're prepared to, to fund. It's not big enough. Acknowledge that we need a national infrastructure bank and let's get this operation going. So I think at this point, we will take some questions. Hi, if I may, can I just interject one thing, Angela? Sure. Uh, let me just say, and, and you have it on, on your uh, paperwork that you showed in the very beginning, all men by nature want to know. And what do you really want to know? You don't really want to know how much money we need to spend. You don't really want to know uh, that we just don't have enough because we use in a, uh, an appropriations process. What you really want to know is we're talking about bettering the lives of every citizen in the United States. We're not talking about money. We're talking about bettering the country as a whole. Thank you. Okay. Um, any more, any more you speakers want to, speaker do you want to get into the formal question period no, no questions are good for us all right tell us um i'd like to really know real quick what you think the biden bill that was just recently passed is going to do where, what's its advantages and where does it fall short well you can put up the slide again if you want to that we didn't i didn't completely go through i think okay, it's like I can, uh just give me a five, second three, i'll get it there for you no. About four five, or five, five, yeah. five or six. We'll, and I'll, I'll just walk <laughs> through it. It's not complicated. All right. go back. No, not. Oh, no, you got to go, go back. back. Go back. Uh, he should uh, never have been charged. Well, what did he do? Where, where was it? Uh, uh, I, I don't understand what he did. No, no, you're doing good. Keep going. This is uh, it. Okay. 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 okay, that chart <laughs> is a comparison. If he were there, to kill people. Oh, should I? All right, somebody else talk. Okay. Uh, this is a comparison between the Biden bill that just passed or the what's called the uh, in Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act uh, that passed and was signed this week. So uh, the way it works is really simple. If you, uh, the categories that are up on the screen were among the uh, most significant categories developed by the American Society of Civil Engineers, which for lack of any other institution is the authoritative institution in the country on determining at least at a preliminary level, what are the infrastructure needs of the country in terms of actual physical infrastructure. And uh, they, what we have is their determination that at a minimum $2.6 trillion of needed infrastructure improvements as they defined it this year, were not being covered by Congress or state and local governments, the three of which own virtually all the infrastructure. They also uh, neglected numbers of critical categories that we decided were crucial, like affordable housing, which is infrastructure, uh, like high-speed rail, like necessary water projects uh, to end the drought conditions uh, in the West, et cetera. So if you take what they defined as the shortfall, plus what we defined as absolutely necessary and hard infrastructure, if you look at your middle category, it says NIB total lending amount. That is five trillion uh, expressed in billions, 5,000 billion. Uh, it makes it easier to break it down. Underneath that are the biggest categories that need to be paid for if we're going to fix uh, and develop our infrastructure. Next to that on the far right is the revised Senate bipartisan bill, otherwise known as the bill that just passed the Congress and was signed this week. That calls for 550 billion 
but the total amount needed next to it is five trillion. So you then go down the categories. And the first thing you look at is surface transportation. The uh, amount that the civil engineers say was needed just to cover the gap, not to build anything new on surface transportation, $1.2 trillion. Uh, how much was uh, need, how much will the NIB, National Infrastructure Bank, cover? It will cover the entire amount the engineers say is required, 785 billion. Mass transit, 250 billion. Passenger rail, 45 uh, billion. That's passenger, not high speed, although we think it really is much higher. Uh, drinking water, the National Infrastructure Bank will cover 800 billion. That's the gap. Power infrastructure, 200 billion. Then go to the right hand side. Yeah. And this is what the Biden bill covers. Out of the surface transportation, where the need is 1.2 trillion, the Biden bill covers one tenth of that, 110 billion. Mass transit, 39 billion. The need, 250 billion really is chicken feed. Frankly, the need is much bigger than that. Passenger rail, the Biden bill covers 66 billion, but as Stan said, could be as much as a third of that's gonna get lopped off by the uh, FRA and the Department of Transportation in their normal you know, uh, bureaucratic carrying costs. <laughs> Drinking water, which includes wastewater, regular water, storm water. The, our bank will fund 800 billion, which is the gap. The Biden bill will fund 55 billion. And out of that 55 billion, only 15 billion is earmarked for um, lead service lines. And the amount, the minimum amount on lead service lines that everybody agrees on is 60 to 100 billion. And the Biden bill covers 15, but the real amount is probably 100 to 200 billion because most places don't look because they don't have the money to fix, so they don't want to know. Power infrastructure, the need 200 billion, we will cover it, the Biden bill 70. Affordable housing, which is urgently needed all across the country. Uh, people are being evicted every single day now, you know, with the end of the moratorium. We were on the phone with the state legislator in Tampa this week where we have a resolution pending. She said 650 families are being evicted in Tampa. Uh, every month they have 7,000 families living on the streets. That's going on everywhere. We're proposing 7 million new units. That's the figure that's the agreed upon figure by all the experts. The Biden administration is proposing zero. They are proposing some in the Build Back Better plan, which may, may with a lot of tax finagling, end up being 500,000 or a million new units, leaving a gap of six to seven million. We'll pay for all of it. High speed rail, zero in the Biden plan, maybe 10 billion max. But that's with a lot of, you know, uh, really messing around. Broadband, it's really over 100 billion, we'll cover it all. Uh, super grid, zero. Large water projects to end the drought in the West, we say 400 billion. We really say well over a trillion, frankly. They say zero. So that's a thumbnail sketch of the difference between what passed and what's needed and what we will cover. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Uh, I just, I guess I wanted you to break it down a little bit more. I'm going to stop the share now. Okay, who else has questions? Um, go ahead, Charlie. Yes. Um, are the services of the infrastructure bank you're proposing performed by federal employees? And will this bring an end to contracting out, I believe, of financial services to the banking community and wouldn't there wouldn't this generate opposition by the financial interest in the United States your proposal Stan I, I can do it do you want to talk uh, or do you want me to do it either way well I, I think what you're asking uh, uh, Charles is, is uh, who is the stumbling block insofar as what we want to do 
The financial institutions we thought would take a very hard line, but they're not. And one of the reasons why they're not is the way that we're formulating how things would be financed and paid back. Uh, very simply, uh, they want an almost instantaneous, the financial services people want an almost instantaneous rate, uh, return on, on their investment. Here, we're lending out, the bank is lending out at a, a rate which is similar to the treasury bond rate or 1.5% right now. And we're gonna do it over the life of the asset that's being put in. Take a water system. Life expectancy is 30 years. 1.5% for 30 years, that's just about free money. And when you think about it, that's why the banks are upset because they need to make more money and they need to make it faster. I think the second part of your question, if I understand it was, does this mean that Amtrak will receive nothing going forward? Is that what your question was? No, no, not at all. No, no. He's referring okay. to the banking opposition in the banking okay. community. That's fine. That, yeah. That's fine. Did well, I answer no. your question? Let me add to that a little bit. We are not, just to be really, really clear, there will be some public-private partnerships uh, in, in this but they really will be limited to those kinds of projects that are where they already work like airports and things like that. What we're not gonna be involved in are the normal public-private partnerships that are otherwise known as highway robbery, ripoffs, you name it, uh, you know, like the Indiana toll road, gee, that was a big success. Like private, you know, where the state had to come back, Indiana come back and take over the whole project. And basically, you know, ended up losing a hell of a lot, like like privatizing the parking meters in Chicago. I mean, really, you know, I mean that kind of stuff that this bank is Adam will not do. We're just not going to do it. Um, now, the, there there will be partnering with the private banking system to build these projects. The bank will take the senior debt. The bank will be the lender of last resort, and in many cases, first, second, and third resort. But this will encourage community banks, public banks. We know there's a big movement in Chicago for around creating a public bank, in Illinois, public bank, but also regular community banks, credit unions, people who normally get involved in investing in the community. This will help them because the, the National Infrastructure Bank is gonna come in, do the lion's share build like crazy and then the other banks are going to come in and get a multitude of business and projects and by the way the big commercial banks like jp morgan wells fargo uh city you know who have large commercial divisions are going to be partnering with the infrastructure bank much to the chagrin of their securities you know, uh, let's create another financial crisis divisions, which have been, you know, basically piggybacking off of the commercial banking divisions, you know, of even the big banks. And, you know, we know where that led in 2007, 2008. So we're going to be really moving the entire financial sector back to investing in the real economy. And, and we've been told that if you have a gigantic national infrastructure bank, this would be the biggest bank in the country, if you were wondering. Uh, if it is prepared to backstop everything, all projects only, and as Stan said, over the life of the project, this bill has no sunset clause, then it will actually allow the big commercial banks, but really the community banks, the neighborhood banks, the mid-sized, the regional banks to partner and get involved in this and it will be good business for everybody. But also, just to be clear, is that even though there were, will be partnerships, uh, the big banks are not going to have a say in what is going to be built and who's going to get the loans. Uh, this is going to be uh, explicitly uh, designed by a board of directors that is going to be uh, 15 people that have had 25 years uh, in uh, manufacturing. This is going to be labor. Uh, other executives, uh, building trades, a uh, couple of, you know, economists, 
and other people that, you know, uh, have actually built these projects. So it's not designed from the standpoint that people are going to think that they're going to use the bank to make a profit. This bank is going to be used for the common good. It's a public bank. It's going to be used to rebuild the country and make sure that it is equitable for all Americans throughout the nation, both rural, urban, red, blue, black, white. It doesn't matter. Infrastructure is for everybody. Go ahead. Raj? Yeah, go, ahead. go ahead, Raj. I'm mute. Unmute. Unmute. You're muted. Raj, you gotta unmute your sound. I'm, I'm, we're just 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 on the bottom. Uh, okay. 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 You got it. okay. Uh, I, I hear these great things, and I have heard it, lots of those things before over the decades. And uh, when bottom line comes finally. The gold, is, gold has turned into silver, and that's what I get. I don't get the gold. And I have seen uh, Congress, local government, uh, city, state, and uh, county, and uh, it's a complicated. It just, just project doesn't go easily, you know, and everybody fights about everything. And about um, all major thing, I don't think, I do not think, you have a technolo technological or management or a labor, re labor resourcing capability. A country, I do not think we have a capability, technologically speaking, to, to build a rail high-speed high railroad. We cannot do it. Let's face it, it's very difficult. We do not have nothing. We haven't done it because we do not have technology. Nobody investing. Okay, now why they are not investing? They are lining up to they are lining up to invest in a in a what do you call it? Uh, the fusion, no, not fusion. What do you call it? Yeah, fusion. What do you call it? That team. The 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 what do you call it? Uh, fusion, fusion. They, they are they are lining up to invest there, but they are not lining up to invest in a high speed train. They are not lining up to invest. In, in a big infrastructure thing. So what is going on? Where are you getting this confidence? This money doesn't do it. There has to be a the management capacity, technological capacity, the, the, the innovative capacity, and uh, what people want at large, ordinary people. They want to trust, I, do I want to trust you with a $25 trillion? Dollars? Just, no, we, we just want five. I don't trust my congressman even. I don't trust my senator. My, I don't trust president even. You know what Trump would have done with $25 trillion. Okay, how can I trust you? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, Raj, is that this is really the problem in the country right now, uh, that the American people have become very skeptical, very fearful. They don't know who to trust. And this is really uh, because of a lack of leadership. And you looked at the difference in the country with Franklin Roosevelt or John Kennedy. When you know Roosevelt took office, people didn't have faith in the government. This is why he did these fireside chats, you know, every week to try to convince people that he had their best intentions uh, at heart, and that uh, that people, you know, uh, that he was going to lay out a program. And it, even if it didn't work right away, he was going to continue to do it until it worked. And people started to gradually have faith in Franklin Roosevelt. A similar thing happened when uh, John Kennedy announced that America would uh, land a man on the moon. And nobody knew uh, how this was going to happen. But people believed in the leadership of John Kennedy that with American ingenuity that we could do it. And I think that uh, what we're finding, and this is really the key, is that, uh, look, you know, Congressman Danny Davis, by putting in the bill, you know, he didn't know the last time he put in the bill, he had a few co-sponsors, and he had the faith in the American people that he was going to put in the bill again, 
that this was the right moment to do it. And he just did it because it was the right thing to do. What we're finding is that people that are not, you know, putting their finger in the air to see which way the wind is blowing, that they're saying this is the right thing to do and we're going to support it. Unfortunately, this is not the case in Washington that you know you have uh, you know severe political games that go on however people are you know especially well i will say both political parties right now are going to have to really get their act together and figure out how they are going to move into the next year going into the midterm elections and all i can tell you is that the th the best thing that we've got going on our side right now is that this has been done four times in american history it worked, it's how the country was built. And what we are reviving in the American people is the sense of this identity as Americans and what we, how we used to think as Americans, what made us great as Americans, and we can do it again. And whether our leadership is gonna do it on their own or not, we've gotta force them to do it. So we're building a movement to put pressure on the Congress to do what's right, and, uh, and we believe that, that this approach is either gonna happen or this country's gonna continue to disintegrate. And that's where we are right now. So my, my, my apology, okay, to Mr. Bond. Uh, you did not answer a question of, do we have a technology? Sure. Okay, do we have a, do we have a labor force and uh, people who can manage these kind of things? Okay, let, let's say, let me simplify. Okay, G give me a technology position of America on a high-speed train, okay, to be a, be, a, be a whole countrywide high-speed train. Okay, what technology we have, what management resources we have, what manufacturing resources we have. Okay, to explain to me, and, and, and let me go further. Let's see if you do only high-speed train, it will be a big, huge thing, high-speed train, all across the United States, okay? Why, why don't you do that? And, and how many years can you do that for me? Yeah. Why does it do want to say about? something? Yeah. Right. As, don't, as as don't, 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 and all, all I can do is point out just, just for China. I mean, in 2008, they had zero miles of high-speed rail. And now they got 23, 24,000 miles. It, it, it's, you got to put them, put the money up. And we have, we have professional labor out there, you know, qualified labor to build it. You know, you have qualified Man, need, you know. Man, where do you see? Well, I, I, see, I see shortages. I have a company, technology company, that telling us that we do not have a we do not have a qualified people, and we need to import. Where do you find all these people you are talking about? Stan, do you want to answer? Because I'll jump in. If not, I'll have fun with it. Well, <laughs> well, if you want to have fun, go ahead. The only thing that I would answer, Raj, is very simply. Okay, uh, you're looking for. Uh, improvements and you want to know the technology to do it. Uh, technology is the result of research and study on any type of project there is. I spoke on the electrification project that the Pennsylvania Railroad had uh, back uh, in the early 1900s. That, uh, that the research to do that project and electrify the Northeast Corridor uh, took about 12 years of research and a lot of people's time to look at what was going on. At the end of the day, that electrification project became the nation's and the world's first power grid. We're talking about the early 1920s, all right? That came out of that program. That program, okay, to electrify the Northeast Corridor simply allowed the United States to move forward with rural electrification, the Hoover Dam, the Grand Coulee Dam, the TVA, 
And today's world where all utility companies are integrated and can supply each other with power. That research, that improvement, that technology will exist as projects get approved and people can see what's going to be needed. You obviously cannot spend the money day after tomorrow. You need to get an approved project and maybe in a year, year and a half after research, you will have developed the technology. As Rick pointed out, all right, in today's railroad world, all right, we don't use a lot of labor. There's a lot of robotics involved with changing out from wood ties to concrete ties to for moving rail. All of that has been developed over time. And we're talking about projects that will do the exact same thing. Even the nuclear Navy we, ha we have today, all right, started long ago in the early 1950s, and that technology has moved forward, all right? That technology gets developed as each project gets approved. Stu, you want to add? Well, no, I was just going to say, right, yeah. okay, go ahead. Two, two, two things. I mean, at the beginning of world, uh, in 1940, when France uh, fell to the Germans, uh, it became clear even to the skeptics that we were going to have to get involved in a war uh, in Europe. And the US, the, the uh, Germans and the Japanese had 20,000 fighter planes. The US had maybe 500, maybe 300, technically 1,000. Um, and Roosevelt uh, addressed the Congress and said, we need 50,000 fighter planes within 12 months. And I think there was mass fainting uh, in the Congress. It was kind of, they, they had to come by with uh, smelling salts and nurses and doctors. I mean, it was a pretty bad scene. And uh, we geared up the country and lo and behold, it took 18 months to get to 50,000 or 40,000. People were in shock that we were able to do it. We, uh, and the way we did it, which is what we're going to do, is they converted, you guys are in Chicago, which is a kind of industrial city, and we converted the auto industry, uh, you know, to build the war machine, the, the uh, uh, arsenal of democracy, you know, which was Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, where I grew up, you know, the Gary, Indiana, the whole thing was converted. Uh, and we went from may, being the best automobile producer in the world, producing not too many cars. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Just to listen, interrupt. here's what we're going to do. We got I'm, the sorry, best. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry. I'm, to I want to finish. I want to finish my fun point. Okay. We have the best aerospace industry in the world. No, we're going to do. We're going to shut down half of it and build high speed rail. We don't need to have every single warplane and every single uh uh, airplane that we're currently making in Boeing saying we hard enough time doing that. We're just shut the whole damn thing down. They can build high speed rail right out of the U.S. aerospace industry, and we can hit the ground running just like we did in World War II. We're the leaders. We have the technology. We lack the all we lack is what Angela said. Somebody at the top who's going to kick everybody else in the rear end the way Roosevelt did when he said we're going to build 50,000 planes. Or when John Kennedy went to Rice University and said we're going to put a man on the moon in 10 years. And frankly, Lyndon Johnson sitting next to him and everybody else fainted because they had no idea how they were going to do it. And we did it. We did it at night. So we'll, we'll do it. We've got that. You know, and, and, and I'm sorry, but it's, it's, it's a strange. You know, I asked a question about today and tomorrow. You give you giving me a bunch of things That's yesterday <laughs> and day before yesterday and my grandfather's grandfather's time. You know how oh. they did it. I'm not interested in that. Yes. I'm interested. In, yes. I'm interested in today. That yes. can you yes. build in five years? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Can you build five years, ten thousand miles of high speed train yes. in the United States? Yeah, and yeah. If yeah. you can do it, do it. more than ten. But no, once you do that, ten is it? Ten is guys, ten this guy's good. This guy's good. Give them 25 right, minutes. Next Come question. On. Look, once we build one, or, it's really simple. Once we build Can't one. Mute one, yourself. <laughs> people are chomping at the bit for this. I mean, the minute that it was announced that all this money was available, I mean, I read the press. People in uh, California think they're getting money for their high speed rail line. People in Seattle think they're getting money for, read the press, read the Seattle Times. Read the LA Times, read the New York Times, 
read, you know, the Dallas Morning, whatever it's called, they all think their high speed rail line is now going to be built. Unfortunately, none of them are going to be. The Washington Post just did an article on that this morning. Finally, somebody came to their senses. We'll Everybody's see. chopping at the bit to do it. They just need a kick in the teeth. We, being the nicest people you'll ever meet, are SOBs. Our job is we kick people in the rear end and we don't stop until it happens. That is the American spirit. Yeah, you know what, if, All right, let's move I, on to Bob Matter. No, one, 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 one comment in that. No, one, no, Raj, one more. we're moving on. One more. Raj, we're moving on, recognizing Bob Matter. Okay, um, uh, I'm just curious. Okay, about, Bob. Uh, what is the current state of the art of high speed rail? Is it, are we going to be uh, modifying existing two wheel track or, are we, or is this going to be on some type of a monorail or what, that's, what, that's you know, what's going on? The, the Chinese right now are building, on and, and magnetic, how fast are these things they're building go? magnetically levitated trains. That's the next. We want to just build a uh, high speed uh, on. Uh, actual rail line. Stan may want to go into that briefly and, you know, go through how that works or Rick. I mean, I could do it, but I'm sure they'll do a better job. Uh, I'll, ju I'll jump in. You know, one of the problems, the reasons why we don't have high-speed rail is not the fact that we don't have high-speed trains. They do exist. I can tell you that the trains that Amtrak has in the Northeast corridor can go 225 miles per hour. Will the FRA allow it to do it? No, it's a highly regulated industry. Amtrak service can do it. The next generation of a cell of trains is going to go even faster than that. The problem is in this country, we live and die by regulation. So it's mm -hmm. not the fact that we're coming up with new technology. The technology exists. I will tell you, being with Amtrak in the early 1980s, we mentioned the time that China started. China, Japan, and other countries came to the United States and actually came to the Northeast Corridor and actually looked at the train service and they modeled a lot of the things that they started doing in the 90s and 2000s as to the same way the Northeast Corridor operates. So it's not the fact that we, we, we don't have the technology. It's a problem of A, we don't have the money and B, we have too much regulation. Rick, you wanna chime in? I, I agree with you there, you know, but like you said, technology exists here, it exists other countries, Europe, China, Japan. I mean, since 1964, they've been building this stuff. It's not like it's developing new technology i mean there's yeah sure magnetic you know maglev trains and everything else that they're developing further but we're just talking electric electrification for high speed rail california is working on their high speed rail now of course they have to go through the process epa you know clearance we a lot of regulations as, as stanley you know talks about in the u.s here going through somewhat red tape to to get this done and of course it costs money so we have the ability, we have the technology, and we always improve technology. It is, you know, exponentially, just like with all the computers, it, everything gets better and better, faster and faster. And we have the ability, we have the trained people, we, operators, we have the operators that are, you know, willing and, and working with, with ever-changing technology now. So, if, if you question what Rick and I just said, Take a trip out to Pueblo, Colorado, to the test facility for America's trains. And they have a two and a half mile track, circuit, almost circular. It's more oval than it is circular. And you can see that the trains that get tested uh, for passengers are well over 250 miles an hour. So it's not a fact of equipment. It's not the fact of how much electricity they're going to use, not what catenary there is, not what wheels they're going to use, not what traction motors they're going to use. It's the fact that they exist, but regulations prevent it. I hope that answers the question. Um, 
you know, um, I, anybody, who has got the next question? Who has got the next question? I, I just heard Stanley uh, um, talk about regulations being a problem. I'm wondering what regulations those are. Uh, I can go through a few of them if you like. First off, the Northeast Corridor is built and it has curves on it. The FRA doesn't like a high-speed train to go around curves that quickly, even though the technology exists to tilt the train so it won't fall over the track. But they're gonna they F, want to F, F what? The F what? FRA, Federal Railroad Administration. Oh, okay. Okay. So that's that's one thing that gets regulated. It's also regulated as to when commuter rail and freight rail can utilize the same space. The FRA <laughs> actually says they don't want freight and passenger rail trains to use the same tracks. But if we don't use the same tracks in certain locations, and you're well aware of this in the Chicago area and the Indiana area, if they don't use the same tracks at certain points of time, because you can build on sidings to let trains pass, all right, the FRA is never going to allow that. They don't want that to happen. And that all stems from the accident that occurred in Maryland back in the early 1980s, where several people were killed because a freight train came on to high speed rail tracks. So it's regulations like that that say we just can't have high speed rail because we have regulations that. But if we, if we built dedicated lines, which we desperately need to do, I mean, the problem is the freight companies own the rail lines. Amtrak operates at the behest of the will of the freight companies, which is absolutely nuts. We should have dedicated lines. Outside of the in, Northeast Corridor. Right. And you could have high speed rail, but it would require money. And the only institution that's got the money is our National Infrastructure Bank to build lines for high speed only. And it would complement the passenger service. And I'm sure we can figure out how to build much more passenger service to connect all the areas that desperately need connections that aren't going to be high speed immediately. And, you know, a lot of rural America needs regular transportation. And nobody um, wants to pay for it except us. Here's another example that Northeast Carter has a problem with. Uh, the, the Northeast Carter between Washington, D.C. and New York started as a four track railroad. It extended out to six tracks. Then it became eight tracks because now you have commuter agencies that want to go on and off the Northeast Corridor tracks. They're going to have to go to 10 to 12 tracks because you've got so many uh, commuter rails that want to come in and out. And the only way they can do that is to have extra tracks because the high speed rail has to use the middle portion of, of the, the right of way whereas the other trains, which have to stop more frequently, have to use the outside tracks. So uh, there's different ways around it, but there's regulations that prevent it. Money is the source of changing those regulations. Well, there have been accidents there. You know, there have been accidents there because going on a high speed in that area, and people are worried about that. So it's not that simple to you can change it or manage it. Because uh, if accident happens, and we have lots of accidents on our rail road. Well, you're, you're going to have a certain amount of accidents. Look how many grade crossings across the United States where someone tries to beat the train to the right. railroad crossing. How do you prevent that? You can't prevent it because uh, people want to play chicken with the train, and they're never going to win. Right. And also, look how many people die in regular traffic accidents that don't want trains. Pro I would say it's probably one of the leading killers in the country that, you know, we keep building more and more roads, uh, you know, at wilder expenses, basically so that, you know, people can sit in traffic. I, I think we should just start building, like here in D.C. and Chicago, we should just build parking lots where people pretend they're going to work but they're really just going to a parking lot. They sit there and they call their boss and say, I've been a park, but traffic's like a parking lot. Oh wait, it is a parking lot. 
And, you know, we have this absolute madness in the country that like, you know, they're building now, this is hilarious. They're building a, this already been approved. They're building a connector between 12 miles of Virginia and Maryland uh, roads that connect uh, around the, the famous DC beltway. And uh, it's being done in a privatized way, you know, like the stupid Indiana toll road. So now not only will people sit in traffic jams, you know what it's gonna cost each way during peak hours, $50 per person, per car to go 12 miles and another $50 to go back. Tractor trailers are gonna be charged $200 a mile. So they have the right to sit in traffic that they partially cause. And all of this is to you know appease the gods of building more and more roads. Or we can build railroads and mass transit and maybe, maybe join the rest of the world. I'll give you one last example. One last example on this high-speed rail. In the 1940s, shortly after the end of the World War, the Pennsylvania Railroad experimented with high-speed rail. They were able to take steam locomotives, put them on the rails, enhance their efficiency, and they went 160 miles an hour. So it's possible to do, and that was 1940. It is now 2021. But again, the FRA says, well, we can't do that. Yeah, you have too many curves and we have this problem. We have grade crossings. I can tell you how much money each one of you paid in taxes to remove the grade crossings on the Northeast Corridor. Billions of dollars because the FRA didn't want great crossings. Great. I was going to add that uh, for all of us in Chicago, we know how many street you know, ad grade crossings there are and stuff. And there are things we could do out there, four quad gates, you know, so all the gates come down and there, nobody can drive around. There's technology out there, but again, it, it's paying finding the finances to to pay for those things but well, it protects people so people can't get across you know they have to break the gate in order to get across it eliminates them from going that direction so there is things out there to help alleviate uh, you know people wanting to go around Looks like Margaret, why don't you go ahead we don't have anybody chairing the meeting anymore uh the thing <laughs> i'm i'm listening char well, I've had my hand up for a while. Anyway, it, but no it doesn't problem, matter. Margaret. No, I just wanted to know one thing that no one's mentioned is the condition of the tracks, because one of the one of the things that I remember reading about this issue is that some of the there there's been some um, what is that uh, uh, delayed maintenance of uh, of tracks and deferred ma deferred maintenance. Well. <laughs> It works out to be the same thing. Yes. At any rate, okay, deferred maintenance of the tracks and uh, the tracks aren't aren't that um, aren't that appropriate anyway, and that you would need to rebuild. Oh, I don't know how much you would need to rebuild. Maybe you can address that issue, or you can talk about the condition of the tracks that wouldn't really allow for um, the the high speed rail thing for the speeds that. that are appropriate on that. I spoke on that particular subject way back about 1974. Let's talk about the tracks that you're talking about, which are freight railroad tracks. They are not high-speed rail tracks. Uh, they don't have a lot of passenger service on. When you get on a highway and you want to go to the right, the highway is slanted, so you go around the curve and you go around it this way, like an airplane in flight. You got to turn that way. Freight railroad tracks, the architecture goes the opposite way. And the reason for that is freight cars weigh a lot and they have to be tilted away from the curve to keep them on the tracks. So there's an architectural problem with freight railroad uh, uh, roadbeds and high-speed rail roadbeds. 
Now to fix that, all right, Amtrak employ Amtrak changed all of the rail in the Northeast Corridor. Placer is the name of a company who produced a track laying machine or system. The, the train or the piece of equipment was a mile long. It was strictly based on technology that you the front part would pick up a track, remove the ties, clean the ballast, then put in new concrete ties, lay the rail back down and clip it and just keep on rolling along. And you could do at, at some time, at, at, at some time we actually did two to three miles of rail a day. That's a pretty good chunk of rail. All right, and, it, and you needed people to do it, but you didn't need what was going on in the early 1900s where you would need a gang of 50 or 100 people the machine itself did the bulk of the work and you wound up having about 12 to 15 people to do it but it gets done that way but there is an architectural problem between the tracks does that answer your question margaret yeah. answer your question margaret Okay, okay. Oh, Charlie, you have your I'm, hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. You have your hand up, Charlie. Go ahead. Did you want to add to that, sir? No, just wanted to say in China where they're building, you know, what Rick keeps saying, in 13 years, they built 24,000 miles of high-speed rail. They're doing massive innovations along the line Stan was just saying in terms of, um, you know, modular units that they can, you know, actually uh, lay down, you know, as they're building the tracks, as they're building the stations. Uh, it's almost as analogous to the way the U.S. revolutionized shipbuilding in World War II, which went from handcrafted to mass assembly line at right where the ships were being assembled. The Chinese are doing the same thing with building their high-speed rail. Uh, and it's knowable technology, which, you know, I'm sure they would Either uh, I mean the U.S. knows about what they're doing. But the issue is just to do it. But it would be, you know, we would le in a funny kind of way leapfrog what we're doing now and really get into the 21st century. And it would involve all the kind of revolutions and new technology and new production that Stan and Rick are talking about. The other thing to remember is China can put in high-speed rail. It's on platforms. It's not on the ground like it is in this country. They also, all right, because of that, all right, they don't even use a full tie. They only use a section of a tie at each end that's hold the rail in place, all right? So they, they, they've come up with those efficiencies, but the real efficiency is the regulation because A, they don't have a lot of regulations in China and B, they're taking everything off of the ground. They, they remove grade crossings they, everything's above the ground by 10 to 15 feet, which means people can't go up there and interfere with train service. So there's a lot of differences, a lot of technology involved with that. And again, our road beds were built in the 1800s. I spoke two years ago with a group in Washington, DC, uh, and I was referring to when President Obama took office the first time, he wanted to put in high-speed rail between Washington, D.C. and Richmond, Virginia. That roadbed, that roadbed actually brought Union soldiers to the South, to the Confederacy. That's how old that is. But he wanted to put, he wanted an estimate as to what would, it would cost to put in high-speed rail. When Amtrak gave the government the estimate, they forgot about the request. So it's a, it's a question of regulation and money. Uh, 50 years back, I went to Europe and I traveled by fast train. That time they had a fast train. And uh, an acquired nice, and I, Come to, come to America, and it would look like a, 
they are back to India. I mean, you know, it just, just, just and that's, that's a 50 years. And we've been talking for all of those years and we haven't done it. Right. You know, and so now, now I don't know. I hope whether you can do it or not, that that's a question. And how long it will take you to do it. Now, yesterday we had a news in India from my hometown to Bombay. They signed a contract with a, with a Japan to build a train because they, they, they won't try to do themselves themselves. They could not do it. They, they raise the speed to 100 miles an hour but then you need a 200 plus mile, you know, and they couldn't do it. So finally, finally, I thought, finally they got wisdom to sign up with China and China is going to build that, you know, and then they're going to build more after that. But everybody uh, takes time, money, technology, planning, resources, experience, and uh, it's not easy like anything else. Right. We know, yeah. we know lots of things. Second World War, we knew everything, how to build, whatever needed. Today, you know, half of the thing we get from China. And then and, and that's, that's right. the question. That, right, but that's our own, yeah, but this is our own fault. And people yeah. can sit around yeah. and say, we're not going to do it. Or people can become Americans again. You know, this is, isn't the last time I checked it, wasn't this guy Abraham Lincoln from uh, Illinois? Some, I know, what do you know? Yeah, yeah guess Illinois. what, Abraham Lincoln, you know what he did before he became president? He was a railroad lawyer. Yeah, you know, he was always running, but in one of his settlements, he didn't get uh, money. He got a tract of land uh, in, I think it was either Iowa or Nebraska. And he went out with uh, Dodge, who became a union general, who's the leading railroad designer. And they personally laid out the track design down to the gauge for the Transcontinental Railroad. Lincoln yeah, personally we, started it. Well, people should be like Lincoln. Either live, um, if you're going to be in Illinois, be like Lincoln or I don't know, move to Wyoming or something. But also, we have, we have you know, Donald Trump and Biden. Talk about that. No, but we have also, Donald Trump and Biden. And they'll be again here. In a, in a two years, they'll be running again. You know, well, 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 but look, you also have to look at the uh, what's happening among the population and that people are indicating that they want to change in their life. And they're not quitting their jobs because they don't want to work. They're just saying, look, I can really do better. And what, uh, so this is a real opening now uh, for people to get trained into new technologies. So it's really just the will to do it. And I think that uh, it would behoove people to actually uh, look at the sort of uh, shift that's going on in the United States right now and either, and, and people really need to believe in the leadership because if, if, if people, there's two ways you can go right now in the population. Either people are seeing no alternative, no exit, and they're committing suicide, or people are saying, look, I wanna change my life, and they're looking for a new opportunity. It is our responsibility to provide that opportunity so that we can you know, uh, you know, mobilize and move forward. But I'll tell you is that it's a, it's a very dangerous thing if people have fear of technology and fear, you know, in this is just a little anecdote is that when um, uh, Roosevelt uh, created electricity uh, in the rural communities, people were so afraid of electricity that they wore potholders to turn on the light. They thought they were gonna get electrocuted. So that is like, you know, people are always afraid of something new. But they turned on the light regardless. Right, because they wanted a change in their life. So people right now are saying, look, I, I don't have a job, but I, I'm, I'm prepared. I, can, I have the resources. I can learn something. I'm not a stupid individual. I can be trained. And I'm prepared to, to uh, you know, uh, to get back into the workforce. They didn't do railroad in 10 years. What am, can you do a railroad in a 10 years? Yeah, we'll do it shorter. Do it. Come on, the, if the Chinese so will do 20 years. We'll be you know? We are we ready to, you know? Yeah, just get, all we have to do is, all we gotta do, build one and everybody will want one. I'm, I'm serious. Look, we got the right. vaccines in, you know, one year. We See, once we put our mind to it and we recognize the urgency, we can do it. Yeah, we're Americans. So we, yeah, we have to dust ourselves off. There are two other questions up there. Margaret, why don't you go ahead? You, Margaret. 
Mute, unmute, unmute. Uh, we have a very divided country. You know, all of this sounds wonderful and we are desperately in need of this, but do we have the will of the majority to cooperate to achieve these things? We've got a country so divided that a good percentage of them wish to go back to the 1950s. So how do we cope with this? Well, Rick, you want to talk? I, I'm happy to talk. I, mean, I know Stan will talk, but I'm happy to. <laughs> uh, sorry, guys, I had to go get a pizza out of the oven real quick. So I am. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. It smells really good. Okay. That's, you, a, that's the American you, thing. Are you going to use UPS and send us a piece? <laughs> Oh, or we'll do it. We'll do it by high school. All right, trail. this isn't fair. <laughs> what if the guys at Lexington Green, the Minutemen, didn't show up? Right there, you go. Yeah, I mean, look, the 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 way we're doing this, Margaret, because you know there are opposite obstacles everywhere. Uh, we just do it. The fun, the hilarious thing is, we're just doing it. I mean, it, we find that the more. People jump into the water, find out that eh, it may not be totally warm, but it's lukewarm enough. More people jump in. I mean, you know, what Rick was saying a minute ago, Rick's been in on all this. You know, we called around, called around, called around, finally found a Chicago city councilman who said, eh, I don't agree with you. I don't think it'll happen. I'm really Michael Rodriguez. I'm not going to do it. He called me back one Saturday. I'm not your guy. I can't do it. It's not going to. And then a month later, he calls me back. Says, All right, I'll put the damn resolution in. And we had two hearings. Rick testified. I don't know if Stan testified or not. In fact, it did. We had a fun time. And lo and behold, Michael was shocked that it passed the darn council unanimously endorsing this bill. He then, you know, helped get uh, Chewy Garcia to co-sponsor the bill and was shocked that that happened. Uh, and then we took it to the uh, Illinois House and Senate. They both put resolutions in, uh, you know, Chicago folks putting them in. So we have that thing moving. Now we've got 22 state legislatures to put them in. The people who passed them in Maine, the guy was completely stunned. He was giving me a hard time for about four months. And final, and he didn't relent because he always liked the ID. He said, all right, let's go with it. Uh, and we had a lot of people like you call their elected officials to ask them to do this. He put it in. The, this was hilarious. He gets the thing drafted in the main Senate. Maine is evenly divided, Republican, Democrat. I mean, it is right down the line, red, blue. And it never went to a committee. It passed the Senate unanimously the minute he got it back from the drafting folks. He walked it down to the House of Representatives two days later. They passed it unanimously. There never was a hearing. We had no idea what was going on, but it was all done by people like you, I'm serious, who really got in touch with their elected officials that I really want you to do this. And that's how it happened. And this has been going on, Stan will tell you, in state after state, city after city, it's not because we're so good. It's because what's currently going on there ain't that good. And, you know, it's like what's coming out tonight. People think this, you know, might be a good idea. And it's something, you know, that's been done. We have a track record and it's something that we either, you know, we either do it or we die. So that's the nice thing about no other options. So that's how we do it. We just start. It's, you know, it's like the little kid who gets these swimming lessons on the side of the pool and he's never sure he's going to be able to really swim. And so, his father, without advising him or even talking to him, uh, when he, the kid's facing forward, he pushes him into the pool. And lo and behold, the kid comes up swimming. It's just how it works. So our job is to you know, push all these gutless politicians into the pool. We're currently working on Marie Newman. I mean, Rick's taking the point on that. We absolutely want her to co-sponsor in Congress. We need all the help we can get, all the help. Uh, and we really want to move this thing forward. So that's how we do it. You know, we just do every uh, single day. We get somebody to make a breakthrough. I hope we can do it. Yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah. So what, you know, as a good friend of mine said, well, we could do nothing. And, you know, and he and I both said, yeah, that's probably not a great idea. Okay, Charlie, you're next, I guess. Yes. Uh, 
wouldn't your plan, if fully implemented, result in the federal government being the single largest employer in the entire country? No. Many no. times more than several multinational corporations combined. And isn't that the goal of the Green New Deal? They call it a solidarity economy. The Green no. New Deal of AOC, isn't that, right. isn't no. that what she no. wants? No, no, no. I, I, yeah, we know what she wants, and you know, but they've never, I mean, they're all hilarious. They've never really quite spelled out what they want. We actually read all their stuff. I mean, we have a, look, we have a lot of people who are involved in the Green New Deal supporting this. No, this is not, look, this is going to be a commercial bank like the Federal Reserve, which I don't personally like. That's another story. But it's going to be a commercial bank with a federal mandate to build all these infrastructure projects working solely in conjunction with the private sector, like any normal, you know, uh, city council, state legislature or other entity does. So the, what this entity is, is simply the bank. Somebody got, wants, to, it's really simple. Uh, everybody wants to know, okay, at the end of the day, who is going to be paying the check? You know, you guys all, I mean, metaphorically, back before COVID, everybody would go out to dinner and if somebody was hoping somebody would pick up the check. Like, I always hope Stan's going to pick up the check. <laughs> He's too damn cheap. He won't pick up the check. So, you know, maybe Rick will pick up the check. And the bottom line is the infrastructure bank's going to pick up the check. That's the end of, that's the key. And that's what we've been told by everybody. They want to know what institution is going to be providing the final financing that it takes for every single project. And that will, they'll start. If you know somebody's there at the end of the day, then you'll start. And what happened under FDR has happened every time the private sector will start to jump in once they know there's somebody there. Look, the, these, a lot of these high-speed rail systems that are being built, the private sector jumps in to actually help when, like to build, you know, at the stations that are built, you know, you've got the rail line, then you got the different stations. They'll go in and they'll actually start building apartment complexes, restaurants, you know, community centers, whatever. And they'll actually start to help on the uh, rail itself once they know there's somebody there who's actually providing, you know, the bottom line financing. So no, this is, we are not proposing a quote, socialist or, you know, government ownership solution. What we're proposing is something that's, as the United States invented this, people go to see the play Hamilton. It got rave reviews. People love it. They think it's the best thing since apple pie. They just never read Alexander Hamilton. I mean, it would help to read Hamilton. I'm mean, just for the hell of it, just to see what it was that made him a genius. Yeah, I mean, this all we're proposing is what he did. People think John Quincy Adams, you know, and these were great presidents. Well, read, read what they did. This guy Lincoln took Hamilton's policy and created the banking system of the United States in two bills in the middle of the Civil War, having nothing else to do. And People should read Lincoln. I mean, it's fascinating. Read Lincoln and you'll say, my God, this is the same thing. People think FDR is a great guy. Well, why don't you read what he did? Now, we are happy to come back because we're nuts. You know, and, and to answer Raj's real question, everybody's real question, you can't trust us. You can't trust politicians. They're full of crap. Everybody knows that. What you can trust is that we will come back and do more and more of these sessions and walk you through in depth what we're proposing and the history. Why? We want to work up. with you. Follow we want to work question. with you. We, we don't see this as a one-shot deal. We don't believe in one night stands. Follow you know, up. we yes, believe in, in the whole thing. I'm sorry. Could I get a follow-up? Yeah. No, oh, I'm so serious. You, you guys name? want to hey, Charlie. Uh, What's your name? Oh. I missed your name. Me, Rosenblatt. No, the first name. What's your sure. Stu. Stu, the first public works project, railroad project in the state of Illinois, I believe it was around the 1840s, was a railroad project 
and they got money from the state of Illinois quite a bit. I think and it was. Who, and who was the legislator and the guy that was in the middle of that? With the money, and they didn't get one, they didn't put down one mile of track. Well, you know, I mean, they, the, the problem. It doesn't always work perfectly. Look, the, the problem is, is, is this question of follow up and government leadership. The guy who was instrumental, by the way, in building and bringing railroads and, you know, infrastructure to Illinois through a state bank was Abe Lincoln when he was a state legislator. But because the country deregulated banking and got rid of the second bank in the United States, which built the, all the railroads in the East, we had brought in this lunatic. You know, Andrew Jackson was completely out of his mind. People may or may not like Trump. Andrew Jackson was crazier. And that's saying something. And the first thing he did was deregulate the banks. He got rid of the second bank in the United States. Guess what happened? The next thing that happened was the crash of 1837, the first major depression, economic crash in the country, which radiated everywhere in the Illinois, which is why those railroad and other river projects got shut down, because everything went under because people allowed a madman, they, he was brought in, it's a longer story, but he was brought in basically to get rid of the bank in the US, you know, so that the Wall Street guys could try to take over and run the show. And that's because they're geniuses. I mean, they'll tell you they're geniuses. I mean, they really are geniuses. Every time they deregulate, we get a financial crash, like what occurred, you know, in uh, 2008. Same thing. Anyhow, that's why it didn't get built, but that's a longer story. Uh, Charles, if I may, I'll, I'll, let me add to uh, Stu's answer. And I have heard about that uh, rail project that you had mentioned just now. You have to remember that the National Infrastructure Bank is more, and I don't think we've said this tonight, but it's more than just a bank. It actually has another function, and that is to make sure that people, states, cities, municipalities, who come in with project requests for the bank to finance a project, we will look at, the bank will look at it from an engineering perspective, who is gonna be the developer, who is gonna be the engineering uh, person. If the, if the municipality does not have a project manager, the bank will act as the project manager to make sure a project gets done, like a water system or anything like that. <laughs> At the same time that's being done for initiation of a project, the bank or the, this portion of the bank will ask for updates on the work that's being done because we're not gonna give somebody a couple billion dollars to do a project right off the top of, of, of our heads and then not know that the money's being spent properly. So there's going to be a formal audit of everything as it proceeds and that will prevent uh, a situation like you just mentioned on that, pro that rail project that's out there. The bank will ensure things get done or they don't get their next installment to pay their engineering people. Now, I also just want to let people know uh, before we, we, we miss this, but... Um, that, you know, as Stu said, this is not a one shot deal. We are building a political movement, a campaign to actually get this legislation, this bank made into law. So what I would really urge you to do, anybody that wants to put their email in the chat uh, for follow up uh, or a phone number. In addition, uh, you can go to our website, which is nibcoalition.com. There's a little uh, thing on the left-hand side that says get updates. So if you put your email in there, you can be invited to our Zoom calls. We have calls every you know, couple of weeks. Uh, this is an ongoing educational process. Uh, we're, as uh, the people that were on the call at the beginning, I said that every single day, we hold two to three or four Zoom calls. Uh, throughout the country with elected officials, city council, county council, state reps, congressmen, staffers. So we would like to set up some meetings in further meetings in Illinois. You can be on the meetings with us. Like if you want to help us set up a meeting with your member of Congress, or your state rep, we'll let you know. We'll set up the Zoom link. We'll let you know what it is. You can join us. 
Uh, but this is a very active campaign. We're not here to just talk to people. Uh, two things that we're doing, as, as we indicated, it's an ongoing educational process and it's an ongoing political movement. So we want everybody to get involved. Who well, uh, is the biggest politician that is supporting you? Biggest name of politician, senator, congressman who is supporting you? Well, Congressman Danny Davis put in the bill. Your congressman in Chicago. Yeah, three, three of them. I need a, I need a bigger, bigger than that. In no. Washington, D.C., uh, some senator. Nobody. Senator, nobody. No senator. Leader. No, no senator. senator. I mean, if you'd like to help us with Dick Durbin, we'd love to get him on board. We'll even give him a free train ride around Chicago. <laughs> the conductor. Tim, why don't we thank our speakers and move on to remarks? I think that's not a bad idea, Charlie. All right. Are you guys willing to stick around for the rebuttals? Because you'll get the last word. I don't think there'll be too many. No, I think. Are we? Do you think we're? Why don't you kick us out? It's all right. We really <laughs> love. We no, don't no, know. No, 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 no. Oh, you want to? Stick around a little while. Yeah, I'd like you to stick around because you can rebut our rebuttals at the end. I don't yeah, know. This you, is a good you, part. Would, you wouldn't share the pizza, so we're okay. a little bit angry about that. Uh, well, there's <laughs> nothing no, no. like Chicago pizza. Yeah. I've had it. This is the best part of the Actually, program. I bought it at Aldi. They're not too bad. They uh, It's called the Super Crust Rising Pizza and put it 20 minutes in the oven. <laughs> the I, don't know. I, like, I like the stuff at the Chicago restaurants. I mean, oh, so do I. But, uh, I had I a vegan re uh, pizza up at Coal Fire up on Addison uh, and Yuck. Southport. See, now, now, it, now it's getting serious. <laughs> hey, vegan pizza. Everybody's, everybody's got their favorite pizza place. That's <laughs> But I have to tell you, having come from the college, going to the attending the college for many, many years, oftentimes the rebuttal is the most interesting part of the All right, day. We'll say, we'll say you, you yeah. twisted our arms. Look, it was okay. either that or Mayor Daly would rise from the grave and give us no alternative. No, he he actually led the investigation to try to subvert the College of Complexes. Well, there you go. See, <laughs> yeah. I'm, 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 I know for where I thought. Anyway. By the way, we do like thorium reactors. Whoever so put that in the uh, oh. chat. You have the what? Oh, I, okay. I like thorium reactors. We should build them. We oh, were going okay. to build them. The only reason why the U.S. went to uranium was because it was easier to build atomic bombs with, which was completely nuts. Otherwise, the lead uh, reactors were going to be thorium. The tests were already being done. We have a, a yeah, bunch of supplies. I'm, 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 all familiar. I'm very familiar with it, and I've actually attended about five uh, thorium energy alliance conferences over the years yeah yeah um, the only trouble is this the united states did research into thorium reactors for many years and decided it wasn't worth it it didn't look no. good and it was no. not feasible it still has india, the same india problem. where's raj it has raj. the same problems as any other nuclear energy thing you produce it you, you use it because of the connections with the military and you make places vulnerable for terrorist activities to to steal or use the uh, the radioactive elements and it is still expensive and it is a long timeline to build we don't have that time so although, I mean, although, you know, I, I won't get onto the thorium thing, I'll get off it, but you know, the leading uh, thorium producer of reactors in the world, Raj, is India. Yeah. Oh, and thorium. Yep, and the thing is, is that um, <laughs> the reason I put the presentation up is not so much for the uh, um, thorium reactors, but Richard Martin in the last chapter of his book, it's a little bit into why America and the world hasn't really um, uh, gotten competitive and what it will take to get us competitive. I'm just going to do a brief is five this minute your re rebuttal. This is going to be my rebuttal. I mean, I'm not posting any All video. Right, why don't just you gonna... formally announce it? Thank our speakers. All right. I'll thank our speakers. And what we'll do is we'll go into our official rebuttal period now. I will go first. I'm going to do a quick share screen because I think this might be a little bit uh, indicative of where the United States is at right now. Um, 
if you can just bear with me while I get it up and running, I'll, I'll be more than happy to show you because this is uh, this is probably a little bit more. It's going to be a little bit of the slideshow from Richard Martin's presentation, but I'm not going to actually play him because I Why think don't you just tell us. I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. I'm going to get into the, why the U.S. is not building infrastructure. Stop. Well, because it's going to provide a little bit more of an uh, of a uh, background for it. Okay. Once I get there. No, it's not cartoons, Charlie. It just is give this me the a guy minute. we've seen five times already. No, this is not one I've seen five times. I've only seen him once or twice. Okay. The you know one of the things that you got to remember is that in the old Roman Empire, there was a guy by the name of Diritititu. And he went around the Roman Empire and was wondering why it was declining. He basically uh, was on the twilight of empire and he rode around Rome and he said the roads have gotten bad. The uh, things were getting into high levels of disrepair. And he said the sea was one of the only ways that he could really do it. And the twilight of his empire was it just cost too much to maintain things in their current state. And that because, you know, the slave labor was going on and it just got too much to cost around with the infrastructure. And the Romans at the time, he's now there was many ways that, uh, people describe the decline of the Roman empire. But one of the biggest ways he said was energy and investment and in the investment on energy. And, you know, he saw a decline of the empire because, you know, the Romans, when they would get their wheat, they would deplete their fields and have to go out farther and farther and farther to bring the resources back in. They built a lot of great projects, but again, it was through neglect that they did it. You know, and the thing was the Romans did have, you know, gears and cogs and even the beginnings of the steam engine back in the first century. It's kind of amazing. They didn't make the connections at the time, but the thing is in a book called the war the march of folly from troy to vietnam most governments want to maintain their self-interest and they want to maintain their governance structures and uh they'll pursue policies contrary to their self-interest and i think in a lot of cases with us in the united states today you know we don't really want to get into grant projects anymore we just want to you know, do Farmville on Facebook or, you know, the next big tech company is in here. And, you know, it's kind of easy to start a tech company because you got the internet infrastructure and everything else. Well, what you may not understand is that we did have a really big infrastructure project underway between 1980 and the present day. And that's the laying of a lot of undersea cables, a lot of the backbone structure for the internet, including a lot of data centers, a lot of switching centers and a general upgrading of our internet network to where everybody can get broadband. The infrastructure exists on a, on a large level to get broadband in where the biggest costs are in that last mile. But we have seen, you know, private companies do great things, but it was only after the government did the initial investment through ARPANET and when it finally uh, was able to get the backbone of the network somewhat under control, and then they opened it up to commercial interests in 1994, and then a company called AOL came along and did it more. But the thing is, it was to our self-interest to get everybody on board. The thing is, though, one of the reasons and otherwise we don't really innovate much or do anything is technology lock-in. You know, Windows is not the best operating system for computers, but it does give you the, it's in about 96 to 97% of operating systems around the world or a derivative thereof. And, you know, it does, it does make a lot of sense and, and governments don't want to do it. We have a lot of disasters going on with us. And that simply means that, you know, many people will, will know that we've seen things like in going back 10 years, the deep water horizon, the um, things, you know, and other, other environmental disasters, and we're still using oil because it works and it's going to take a lot to get us out of that technology. The thing is, is that I'm going to be uh, going a little bit here now. Um, the United States does not do bold ventures anymore. But the thing is, we have done it in the past.
not only that quiet revolution went on with the internet, but you know, we did it with the moonshot. We made a commitment and we did it. And the thing is, the whole national approach was behind it. Sure enough, yeah, it was with envy of the Russians, but we got there and we did it. And look at all the benefits we've gotten now with the satellite communications and everything else. And the thing is, even back then, um, we had a rebirth of the U.S. auto industry during the Great Recession. But the thing is, there's several lessons that we can pull out from the energy industry that we have to do. First off, we have to have a sense of crisis. And I think we're getting that now with the National Infrastructure Bank that you're talking about. And there has to be broad social and national goals. That's the upgrading of our technology and our social uh, awareness of, of, of the bad infrastructure we had. And then we have to have little or limited and conditional government support of it, the infrastructure bank being the thing. And then when America really starts making up its mind, it can go forward. And the thing is, I think we can do this. Now, the rest of this presentation simply goes into, uh, you know, how, how they could do a thorium program in the next few years and how it could do. But the thing you got to remember here is this, you know, we make things still today. And it's a, a jet airplane, for example, is one thing that we make very well. Yes, there are things we've seen some mistakes in the, the uh, recent jumbo jet with um with uh you know Boeing and it's a 747 Max, but generally the aviation industry is one of the most safest in the world, and these things are a hell of a lot more complicated than roads and bridges, and we can do it. You know, the thing is is that uh you know in his book Superfuel he does make in chapter ten a very good argument. I just gave you a little bit about what he said in my own words, but basically it boils down to this. We, if we're going to do infrastructure, the Biden bill is a good start. But if we need our competitive advantages, we've got to look to China. we got to look to some of these other places. And we have to start looking for solutions to our things. Now, China has a very directed communist country where all the elites say is, we're going to do this. There's not a lot of political opposition to it, but they do get their companies going and they do get their people running. And yes, they have their infrastructure. It, it, and it, and it, the thing is, though, there have been, too, in China, some aspects of corruption and some other things that have come in there, particularly with there. But if we really want to look to the model of building high-speed rail, we just have to look at Japanese railways. What they've done, they've never... They've had a very incredible safety record. I don't think there's been anyone killed on our killed on their trains in the last few years. But if we want like our, our national rail infrastructure and roads and bridges doing good, I think we can do it. And the thing is, even with going to uh, getting off oil, you know, there there's a lot to be said for renewables. But I still think that the small molten salt based reactors will be the only way we'll get off oil because it's the only way we'll have small concentrated energy supplies over the next you know 50 to 100 years and we can build these things as a matter of fact china in its desert is making the, the making the prototype now so that they can commercialize these things by 2030 and get them all over the world and uh you know the infrastructure bank is a good idea and yes, I was not aware of the uh, Hamiltons and the other parts about the world and the, you know, the other parts of the infrastructure bank, because I know a major part of the problem is that, you know, now in order to build a road, it takes 15 years to go through all the various governmental agencies and the environmental impact statements and getting rights of way on land and everything else, which in a sense is kind of crazy. But anyway, that's my two cents. I thank you guys for coming. And I do think that if we get the will nationally to do this type of thing, we can. And uh, I'll end my rebuttal there. Okay, next, next one, please. That's great. L love the SMRs. <laughs> you, should, you should get out to, uh, you should, I'll, I'll have to show you some resources here. Yeah, we'll go to Oregon. <laughs> We Go have ahead. One, of the, one of the companies is here in Arlington. What? Uh, which one is, is Arlington, Virginia? New Scale. New scale yeah, we're in Virginia. Oh, okay. Yeah, but New it's basically Oregon. 
and then Bill Gates, the Terra, whatever it's called. But the Terra rod reactor, I know Terra power and other things. What's called New Scale, right? Yeah, New Scale. They're the the leader right now. Okay, that's good. All and right, Biden, no, by the way, increased the nuclear budget by fifty percent. Quiet. Really? Oh yeah. Well, the thing is, we're we're going on that one meets the eye. Well, that that's probably a good thing. Who's got the next rebuttal? Charles. Raj, you want to go? Let Charles go. Charles want to go. Charlie, go ahead and get your rebuttal going. Then we'll give you five minutes or how long it takes. So lower your hand and uh, go ahead. All right. First of all, I'd like to thank our collective speakers for a very nice and informative program. And thank you for your efforts uh, towards implementation of the plan. I'll be eclectic as usual. Very quickly, I've got a number of things to go into. Number one, regarding uh, plans for congestion. I just wanted to say that nowhere in the United States anywhere has building another lane of a highway ever relieved congestion. Uh, and any plan to do so is frivolous. Uh, regarding the rebirth of the auto industry, you take Maybe a look at I-90, Charlie. Beaches. Maybe we should have let it die. Um, another project, the infrastructure project we're going to have to deal with is that there are an estimated 100,000 carloads of nuclear wa waste, which we don't know what to do with. <laughs> and you guys want to build more nuclear reactors. You so recycle we have it. We want 150,000 carloads of nuclear waste. Good idea. Come on, get out of here. Number two, um, Metro alone, it is estimated, I testified before their board on uh, their budget, needs $10 billion in maintenance of way work and new locomotives uh, and low carbon uh uh, locomotives. The next thing is one trillion dollars for high speed rail is yeah. a lot of money. And I'd like to see it, but that's a pretty stiff price tag. One trillion, according to your figures there. Uh, I've heard some belly aching as usual from the railroad industry about regulations. And they're always and the Staggers Act save the freight railroads of the United States. Let me tell you, regulate, what do you want to return to the days of the railroad tycoons? That's, and those guys, J.J. Hill and, uh, come on, the rail freight rail, it was a chaotic mess, crooks. I, I'm sorry, Ed. you've got to have some regulation. That's the one industry that <laughs> cried out for regulation. Um, the uh, five, uh, next one is, uh, yeah, we certainly need expansion of Amtrak. Most assuredly, the we need to buy some train sets. They're fairly expensive. I didn't know they cost so much, like 10 million bucks or something each. Uh, we need to have a service extended to the uh, western part, northwest of Illinois, there's a big blank space there and traveling further on west. We certainly need expansion in that regard. If anybody wants to know about the Transcontinental Railroad, go to my website and you can get my two hour historical lecture on the <laughs> anniversary of the building of right. the Transcontinental Railroad and every detail and facet of the project. That's it. Uh, if you go to the site, of the uh, Facebook um, of the New York and Chicago Railroad. You can find that program, a link to it. And it's well worth the time. I recommend it for everyone. That's basically it. Um, but I thank you very much. Uh, I uh, look forward to getting perhaps personally more involved in your efforts in that regard. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I make a comment to one of the comments? One of the. Are you rebutting a rebuttal, Stan? I'll rebut it. Go. go ahead. 
Oof, this is serious. Uh, Char Charlie, your one comment about nuclear waste. Yeah. All right. I've I've been on the phone for the last couple of days, and I will tell you that there's a company in Camden, New Jersey, called Holtec International, which deals with different ways to eliminate the nuclear waste that's out there. And they've got some projects that are going on and they're going to move forward with it. At the same time I was talking to them, I talked to uh, the uh, tunneling uh, uh, organization that put in the channel uh, or designed the channel between England and France. And they are developing a ways to carve out portions as, as large caverns so that the nuclear waste can be stored uh, in, in these caverns. So I know of two companies that are working very hard to eliminate the nuclear waste. So I, I think the answer is going to be coming. All yeah. right, we got the model. Is nuclear reactors produce the purest form of pollution. It's deadly, colorless, odorless, and one microbat will kill you. You don't want any system that produces pollution like that. Have you ever, sir, ever heard of clean energy? Yeah, we have, you Charlie. Don't have this problem. This, Solar by panel. the way, the other thing on nuclear waste, because I am working, I have a contract pending right now with a uh, kind of large property in Mar-a-Lago, Florida, where we're working. <laughs> to... I'll vote for that one. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Margaret, you have your hand raised, so go ahead. Yeah, and in the fine tradition of the uh, college, we're all talking about something else besides what you brought up. But, um, and, which, and I appreciate the the your presentation and, and it's obviously something that we all need to learn a little bit more about and it just seems kind of really vague but you know um but, but it's an extremely complicated thing so what do i know anyway but in terms of the um i think if charlie's point is really valid about uh using nuclear sources to generate power and it is that we are not able to safely dispose of one ounce of the ton of radi radiated, pro uh, product, radiated materials that each plant that we have in this country produces every year. Now, Chicago has got 11 nuclear power plants around it. So yeah. every year we have 11 tons of radioactive material that we don't, there's no way that um, it can be disposed of safely. So what anti-nuclear, uh. the anti-nuclear group that I'm involved with is saying that hardened above ground storage is truly the only way to go because you know when it's leaking and you can fix it. And the, because if you, if you don't use that, method, then you have unsafe transportation. You were talking about um, accidents and going on uh, across things when you ship things by rail. When you ship things by truck, we have truck accidents all of the time. When you ship things on barges, there are accidents with barges. I mean, we had a big barge jam in the Suez Canal or whatever the other um, or the, I don't know, maybe it's a Panama, Panama, no, Canal, Suez. Right? Suez. Panama Canal. No, and so, you know, there's any kind of, of thing that we've invented to transport things, just because of the nature of the system, there's going to be an accident. And when you have an accident, it's going to be released, and then there you are. And the word is F U C K E D. So um, the it, it's it's extraordinarily dangerous if you take uh, and and the I was looking up half lives thorium's half life is fourteen billion years. So in fourteen billion years, if you have a pound of thorium, which you'll have a lot more if you implement all this bullshit, you know, 
you you have half of it that is just as radioactive. If you have a product giving off gamma radiation or beta red radiation that you're not able to protect yourself against, then if you if you have, for example, plutonium, it was estimated, and this is a long time ago, so the the uh, numbers are different now. But at the time, and this was in the 60s, if you ground up that block of one pound of plutonium and took a piece, a, a teeny little piece of that and put it in every person that was alive on the earth, within a month, they would be all dead. Because if you inhale it, if it gets into mucous membrane tissue, like it's inside your lungs, like it's inside your stomach, you get cancer because it irradiates and destroys the DNA in the cells and produces tumors and you have cancer. That's it. That's, that's all she wrote. That was something that the people had to be very careful. And there were nuclear accidents. We knew a man who's uh, worked on the uh, Manhattan Project in, in New Mexico. And uh, there was somebody who was burned so, so horribly and he died within a week yeah, because of the radiation thing. Now, the, the, you know, the, the, and the money also, the nuclear industry is subsidized by us. We have the, uh, the legislation that's introduced every 10 years that we, the, the United States, the people of the United States basically take responsible responsibility for paying damages above a certain amount, which is, uh, you know, a couple billion dollars, which will be nothing uh, in terms of addressing the amount of damage to, that, to be done in case of a disaster. You know, how, so we're responsible for that. We had to subsidize that. They wouldn't build the plants unless there was some kind of so, insurance, so but we're the ones that are providing the insurance. So we pay billions of dollars. We have potential to pay billions of dollars for that. We already pay the billions of dollars that it takes to set up each plant. There's a couple of plants now that, that had to stop because their cost over, the only two that have been built since what the 1970s or whatever, that we we stopped building them because the cost overruns were astronomical. Now you're saying that thorium and small regular whatever, but that just spreads out the disaster. You know, something happens and, and it, it just spreads out the potential for disaster. This is we we are not perfect people. Wh whatever needs to hand, we've opened the sorcerer's box. We've opened we're the sorcerer's apprentice. Who, who used his spell to clean the house and it just kept going and going and became totally out of his control. We don't have, I'm, this is still my time guys. That we have, you know, we, we don't have the technology. We don't have the knowledge. We don't have the ethical structure and moral principles to deal with the problems that this has caused. We don't have any place that's safe to store this, no place that is safe. The, 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 recept the things that you're talking about, like even in, in, in Utah, in Nevada, the place in Nevada, there were two earthquakes on that property that the second one destroyed the, the part of the, of the uh, entrance building on the property. What is it? They're choosing the sites for political reasons. They chose Nevada because they have one representative in Congress. And so, you know, that's uh, so that they couldn't, uh, they, they weren't able to fight against the, the uh, money that's behind the nuclear industry. So, you know, we're, we, if you talk about thorium or anything else being a solution for the energy problems, You've got your head so far up that you can't see anything anymore. You're not looking at real facts. You're not looking at real, real things that are going on. That's my opinion. You know, you obviously are smoking something else. So there you go. 
Yeah, I'm not smoking the crack of clean technology is going to save the world. That the oh. nuclear, that wind and solar will save the world. Right, right. I'm not smoking that crack. Because yeah, it's yeah, not. Definitely, yes, you are. You are smoking crack. Okay. Well, look at the look, look at something right. called the roadmap to know. All right, next, 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 next rebuttal. All right, who's who's next, please? If nobody else, I'm speaking. All right, go ahead, Raj. Uh, you guys have a great ambition and probably great project. And you have done perhaps your homework, I don't know. And uh, it will be good for the United States that you are doing it. I do not know if you have a right, right combination of Things needed to make this project fly. I, th I think it's. I think uh, when you do a multi-dimensional and such a big level, you are basically asking chunk of chunk of uh, government, chunk of uh, power of Senate and Congress and governors and lots of other people, and it's not easy. Anything you want to do, divide your Congress you know, and a Senate, which is kind of a very on the edge and two highly divided people. So it will be hard. And uh, I like to say that if you are going to do anything like that, the one person I, I like you guys to talk to is Elon Musk. I think he has been very successful <laughs> in a taking game. You better, be care you better be careful, he's pro-nuclear. Well, oh, it we may be. Well, I'm, I'm, but we will talk to him. He's hilarious. I'm 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 okay for nuclear. I'm not I'm not against that. I'm and you know it's a, it's a different different business. Let, let let's stay with uh, your project and making right. America better. And uh, that is a different story. It is a good idea. But but uh, Elon Elon Musk has a good grasp, I think, that uh, what he, what what technology what project time has come where all the, all the ducks are in a row available and it puts them together and, and make it work project. And, and a guy like that can give you good advice, you know, on, on terms of what, what, is, what is ripe and what is not. And uh, I, think, I think that can help to advance. I still, I do believe in a, in a railroad project, fast high speed railroad. I think, I don't think we have, we have to start building from scratch because uh, Europe is doing very well. China is doing well. Japan is doing as a, as a team told, you know, and Japan is doing very well. Yeah. And this and China is building in India now. Okay. So so we have it. We have everything. We have people who know it. So we let them do it. Let them come here, do it, you know, they say, hey, look, you want to do it and we give them a good deal. And, and, and so let's do that way. But we do not have to start from scratch. I don't want to. I don't want to go there. We our our railroad is a mess. We have to totally redo it. The the east east coast you are talking about, you know, it requires completely redone. It's a mess. The railroad system. So we have to. And uh, the lots of infrastructure project you are talking about, they are already there, but Congress is not able to decide. And I do not know that anybody want to trust the what your setup we. I don't think anybody want to trust 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 anybody like that in this time. We are not able to trust uh, our neighbor or in the Senate anybody willing to trust anybody. Even with, within a party, they are not able to trust. So it's very difficult to very difficult for me to see that you can navigate through Congress and Senate and state legislatures and. Uh, State politics and everything, you know, the, that the black black congresswoman you are talking about from South Side, yeah, he's been enthusiastic on lots of things, but it doesn't 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 everything happen. Okay, that's reality because there, he, there is a limit, there are lots of limitations. He doesn't have that much power to do anything, anything happen. So, what I say is that if you if you promote something and uh, if you lobby to do one thing, if you do one thing, you succeed, people have confidence. But you went through that, okay, give me a whole house, let me move in and I'll 
I'll make it better. I don't think it's going to happen. It's not Raj, Raj, do you want to yeah. be the first passenger in that guy's super loop at 750 miles per hour? Yes, I <laughs> Well, you know, you, you know, things can happen, but let, let, let's talk seriously. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's, yeah, we're not, we're not talk, I mean, I'm, not, I don't want to talk about, you know, all those things. I'm, I'm serious because of money, people, and what obstruction we have in this country. I mean, people, the committee, committee, a congressman or, or the senator will stop the project because he disagrees. Okay, so uh, anyway, anyway, I, I wish you luck, whatever you are doing, and, and I hope something comes out of that. And I think probably lots of other people will have idea and they will come out with the alternate idea and there will be competition of idea and probably country will be good for that. And I hope uh, that, uh, I, I don't know, I don't I don't think bank bank want to manage directly anything. You still have to have a, you know, the account uh, finance companies and, uh, and who investors and all those things, if they are ready, to, you, you have a, you find them, you find some of them. And that's what I look for. I look for, I, I look for a Wall Street. How much enthusiasm there is on, on a particular project? How many banks? How many banks have promised you that they will join you? And all those things are there to do the do the job you want to do. And I wish you luck. Thank you. And thank you, Tim, for letting me speak. Thank you. Okay, Raj. Who else has a rebuttal? Okay, um, so I, I, I want to ask. Uh, you know, I looked. I went to the NIB Coalition website, and I'm going to read the article that. Uh, is there, uh, the letter uh, regarding a bill that's there. Um, and I want to know, it was mentioned that you'd like to work with somebody on Dick Durbin. And I'd love to do that because I think Dick I Durbin does not idea. belong in the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> you want to work After out he... him work him over. <laughs> uh, at any rate, um, I've been to many events, uh, or, or actually, Marie Newman has been into some events that I've been at with Southsiders for Peace, because he's been the representative for the people in um, Beverly, uh, and uh, so his his her assistant gave me uh, his email address, and so I have that connection. Um, and I'd like to know what I should uh, uh, connect, what, what I should say to her, to, to the assistant. I, I think um, what we should do is this in all seriousness, because Rick's really, you know, already talked to her and we had an excellent meeting with his top staff in Washington, his top person. And I think what we need to do is if we, if anybody else would like to help, we need to get a group of people who are from the area. Uh, and set up a meeting with her, preferably, face-to-face, -face. Uh, Zoom call, probably the best, and actually give her a presentation on how the bank will work and what the support is. And I think we'd have a shot at getting, I, I could be wrong, maybe Michael Rodriguez or somebody else would get on that kind of call uh, if it were with the Congresswoman. Uh, and that we need to talk to her face-to-face. And the best way to do it is if a group of people uh, would like to work on this. I don't know if anybody else. And by the way, the bank is not going to finance energy generation projects. And that includes nuclear, solar, wind, you know, um, I, I, something that people are doing in their basement. We're not going to do generation. So you don't have to worry. The nuclear discussion was strictly, you know, poisonal points of privilege, but not, not part of the bill. Uh, it's strictly infrastructure. But if other people would like to, you know, participate, uh, I think it would be worth it having a second call uh, to discuss uh, how to approach that. But also, are there other groups of people like the peace group that you're part of, Janice, uh, that would be interested in having a discussion about this? Uh, we're serious. And I would people, love, yeah, I can contact them and ask. If they would like to get two, three, four, five, half a dozen people together for this kind of a call, and maybe some of the people on this call would like to join that, uh, that's what we would like to do. And out of that, see, we need, we need to get a group of people from Chicago, 
who want to approach Marie Newman, you know, preferably yesterday, uh, to put this at the next level. Look, we had an excellent meeting with her top person. Her top person is excellent. The question is to get to her. And the fact that uh, Chewy Garcia is on the bill, along with, you know, who I think is one of her allies, and Mondaire Jones from New York is a progressive Democrat in her camp. He's not a moderate Democrat at all. Uh, she would be somebody we really want to have a meeting with, but we want to do with a group of people. We don't want to do with two people. I, I live in that district, and she's one of my Facebook friends. Look, if you would like to participate in that kind of meeting and have a discussion first, you know, as soon as possible, whenever you'd like to set it up. I mean, we're, I mean, I think Rick is game, you know, we're game. Uh, and if there are other folks on the call, I don't know if they are game. And if not, no big deal. Uh, How to contact you if, if I get a response from the South Side of You got a pen? I'll put yeah. my phone number in. I mean, I'm kind of the old school here. Can I just type in? How do I do that? Yeah, just type it into the chat. I'm going to put yeah. my phone number in. Everybody else calls me. Most okay. Hey, um, call me bad names, but that's let's fine. let our speaker, there's <laughs> nobody going to be rebutting anymore. Um, I love let's... change. Okay. Let's... That's, that's for the positive. All right. Uh, let's get our speakers in for their final words and then we'll. Uh be on our way. So uh, go ahead. And I know there were three of you speaking. So the three of you can do your final rebuttals. Yeah, Rick, you want to start? Oh, uh, well, I wanted to, again, thank, thank you all for having us here and having me here in addition and, uh, and your time and, and a lot of, I like the rebuttals. I like the, I like the, the conversation and it's, it's all positive. And um, again, what we're trying to do is, is better you know, the real build back better. Um, and, and again, all, all your, you know, your, your rebuttals are, are great. You know, the information you got, anything that we could do to, you know, to help clarify. And, and again, we're, we're trying to, to, again, make it keep, do the things, not kick the can down the road, so to speak, and, and, and do, do real infrastructure. So it's my short bit. <laughs> Yeah, I would just say that I am extremely optimistic about the moment that we're in right now, uh, because it was precisely uh, what Raj says, it's actually the moments when you have to start from scratch that really tests your fortitude and what you have to do. When after the revolution, when George Washington and Alexander Hamilton you know, realized that they had to fulfill the principles of the revolution. They started from scratch and they made the country into a manufacturing and industrial nation. Very similar to what was done with Abraham Lincoln. And then of course, what everybody knows about, we virtually started from scratch in the Great Depression. We went from the very similar situation that we're in now with huge economic disparity. Everybody knows the whole you know, uh, story about the, uh, the depression years. And we went from that to becoming the greatest industrial power in the world. So that was the, uh, the, those periods. It was existential for the country. The model that all these presidents used was the model of the National Infrastructure Bank. And that is precisely why they became the greatest presidents this country has ever seen. And we are committed to, you've heard this argument, you know, over the last couple of days, did the American people elect Joe Biden to be FDR? And we are, you know, asking the question, is there still time for Biden to be FDR? And we believe that by fueling the fire in the movement that we've created, that this absolutely can happen. Right. I, I support all that. I just want to thank everybody for having us and tolerating our totally wild ideas. Uh, it, it was, you know, really very un Chicago to be this tolerant. Dick Butkus, <laughs> Dick Butkus is probably just, you know, couldn't handle this. Uh, anyhow, I really like Chicago and my view, and I've had great times there and been, been there a number of times, is that as soon as we get the stupid pandemic over, we want to come out 
join everybody uh, at one of your best pizza restaurants <laughs> and just have fun and talk and, you know, kind of put everything out on the table. But in the short term, we'll do more calls with you. Uh, you got my phone number. Give me a buzz. I also send out for free a weekly email uh, on both the financial mess and the progress we're making on this infrastructure bank. If anybody wants the weekly email, it's free. Just put your email in the chat. I'll send it to you. It just says, it's got a catchy title, Legislator Alert. Uh, and uh, anyhow, otherwise I had fun and I, I'd really like to get out to Chicago and hell with all the Zoom stuff. <laughs> And I just put my email in the chat, anybody that wants to communicate with me, or as I said, if you want to get our general updates, just go to the website and put in, it'll say get updates, you just put your information in. This yeah, is one of, reach. this was one of our more calm things. Uh, there are times when it is not calm here. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was screaming one time. Oh, well. Well, we have fun. I mean, our view is, you know, sort of stir the pot, see what happens. Yeah. But we're happy to come back also. You know, we're, we're, we're gluttons. You know, the, the, the thing, just in terms of what you said, Margaret, the problem is, is that people are very frustrated. So, you know, uh, most people just paint the picture of how bad everything is without having a solution. And so if you don't have a solution to deal with it, it's just you know, a bunch of people getting to, together and just, you know, presenting their gripes, which, you know, there's thousands, right? So, you know, things are not perfect, but as I said, we've got a model to move forward and in the imperfect world that we're in, we're gonna do it. Well, I think, well, okay, that's fine. I was just gonna, well, All I right. wanted to comment, what the hell? Um, I'm a retired nurse practitioner, which means I have a, a master's degree in post-master's certification studies at the University of Illinois. At the University of Illinois, and um, and there were some people with conspiracy theories who were anti-vaxxers, and it, you know, it was it was truly nuts, nuts, nuts. nuts. That's <laughs> the right word. It was really nuts. Don't you? And, Look, as a nurse, you know, you know the famous far side. <coughs> far side the, there was a famous far side cartoon. Uh huh. You know, people remember the far side or not? Anyhow, it's yes. just imagine, imagine that you're looking over the shoulder of a psychiatrist. You're looking over his shoulder. He's examining a patient. The patient is on the couch, arms and legs flailing, mouth going completely wild. You're watching the psychiatrist take notes on his uh, analysis of the patient. And here's what it says, just plain nuts. <laughs> but, you know, but you have, to, you have to have a bit of compassion for people because uh, the system right now and everything around it is really just driving people crazy. And that's why we think that, you know, by putting forward a sane, foundation to move forward, whether all the crazy people, whether they're Republicans, Trumpsters, whatever they are, anti that whatever they are, that by, you know, aligning people around a positive policy, it will bring the, out the best of people. Well, well, we, we really hope so. I think, you know, part of the difficulty is, is that the Republicans and some Democrats, I mean, I, I don't exempt the Democrats from being obnoxious and awful, have attempted to destroy the educational system and have weakened the educational system with all this bullshit about vouchers and cutting funds to, to uh, private, it's private it's primary and, and, and secondary education. And even though 90% of children are educated in public schools, you know, we want, we, we're cutting funds because it's, it's a cost. It's not an investment, which is what it should be looked at right. as. And so what we've done and, and allowing uh, the alternative theories where, you, you know, you, you have to, it, it, until the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that in public schools. You know, you, could, you couldn't teach creationism as a science. It's still taught like that in, in many private schools. So you have a group of people who are totally non-functional in a scientific world. And then you have um, 
you know, just where people don't trust science and then you have all these and they don't have the tools right. to look at the conspiracy theorists and look at these anti-vaxxers and look at all of this stuff that's going on and look at it critically so they can they don't have enough information they don't have enough knowledge they don't have the the skills to to look at it to say you know this is bullshit yeah but this is how but this is how nations self-destroy this is what happened in nazi germany there are many people that look people voted for adolf hitler sure they voted twice seven million million germans voted for Voted for Adolf Hitler, knowing exactly what was being proposed. Well, because they agreed con- with it. That was the problem. Oh, but that was started by the lunacy after World War I with the reparations policy, which yeah. and the and the deindustrialization of Germany. And I agree, was, I agree. I mean, whole sections of the country were deliberately taken over and robbed by the French and the British. You know, when this nut Wilson, you know, eventually went nuts, uh, you know, because of the mess he had created. And, you know, you it took how long? Not long, 12, 13, 14 years for the net result to end up being people voting for Adolf Hitler. But you have yeah. potentially the same situation right now yeah, the, in this country because if people this are co- fixated on a small budget and saying that we only have this amount of money. So only a few people are going to benefit from that amount of money. Then you you lay the grounds for fascism because you say, okay, then these people are going to live and those people are going to have to die because we can't we don't have you know all the uh, potential to uh, provide for everybody. And that's exactly what we're we're getting at is that we're saying that the bank is going to fund everything, but the but the thing that we're going to develop are the people of this country. That's the greatest resource, right? It's not just about money. You have to develop people. People can learn. You have to believe that people can be educated. We, we have to, we, we got to roll. I have one minor question. Janice, do you want the email? Uh, I know Charles put his email in. Do you want my weekly email? Like a yes or a no? Um, sure, free? sure. Oh, that's free. It's free. One of the few things that are still free, you know. You know. <laughs> so look, we got to go, but we really, really enjoyed yeah, it. It was fun. a great discussion, and uh, somewhere, sometime, we will meet again. Invite us back. <laughs> We're game. Thank so you. where are you at? You're not We're in Chicago. Virginia. Yeah. We're in Northern Virginia. We're outside oh. of DC. We we used to actually go into DC. It was you know. Just but just before the cavemen got out of the cave. But we, we were in Chicago years. about what three years ago? Two two, two, years. two yeah, to three years, years ago. ago. Yeah, yeah, we had fun. We went in numbers of times. I, we had fun. I, I I like Chicago. We went to a hilarious restaurant which got eventually apparently just closed called Il Joco. Oh we, look, it was an Al Capone speakeasy turned into a restaurant. And they gave us a tour because I knew something was. Up. It was really great. We were the only they, ones that were interested in going down. Well, I saw the basement this main van. Seeing where the underground tunnels were going into. Like, yeah, where Michigan. they were running the booze in the <laughs> into the restaurant. They had a they had a <laughs> fake library, which was a double door that went into the illegal speakeasy. Yeah, they they should, gave us a but, tour. But they, it was it was a great was, Italian restaurant run by Mexicans. No, run by Colombians. Come on, who runs? In the, in the great Chicago <laughs> tradition. Thank you very much. Again. All right. We're going. We got to run. Thank all right. I'm going to stop the recording of the meeting yep. now. Okay. All right. Talk See you soon. all.